Yeah. And then, oh, I'm paddling and I can't find my way out of this thing. Now watch what he says in the latter part of the chapter. He says in verse number uh, 20, 21, ah, uh, well, I want you to look at verse 22. Well, verse 24, for the sake of time. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, who's going to deliver me? Come here. The word wretched describe the state of a prisoner who if he committed murder had to strap a dead man to his back so he would walk around part of his punishment was to walk around with a dead man strapped to his back are y'all following us and, and he would carry it as proof of his condemnation Everybody who has not gotten Jesus in their life and they are in the tug of war with doing good and that which is evil, they are like a prisoner walking around with a dead man strapped to their back. Everybody, while you walked in here straight up, really you walked in here bent over, carrying a body of sin that you can't free yourself from. And he says, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin that's strapped in my life? He says, I thank Christ Jesus who hath delivered me. Now, what he just painted the picture of is condemnation. A prisoner condemned carrying a dead man on his back. He says, who's going to free me from that condemnation? Who frees me from the inability to deal with my sinful appetite? I thank Christ Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Do you see the picture? Yeah. Now when you get to chapter 8, he says, therefore. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. See, you, see, now, see, now you shout on 8. Because I saw in chapter 7, I was strapped down with a dead man on my back. I was in a tug of war trying to figure out how to deal with my sinful passion. God, how you going to get me out of this? I thank Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation. I have lifted the verdict guilty and you're no longer headed for punishment. Now y'all see it now? You got to deal with this sinful passion stuff, man. Now watch this. How did, how did he do it? You in chapter 8? Uh, I promise I'm almost done. You good? Watch this. Now that there's no condemnation in Christ, verse 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free. All right, what set me free? The dominance and the rule of the Holy Spirit. That's how he's using the word law. The rule and the dominance of the spirit has set me free from the law of sin and death. Come here. The law of sin and death was not Moses' law. The law of sin and death is what was dwelling in your members. Come here. But the, the law of Moses could not fix the law of sin and death. You got it? See, some people think the law of sin and death was Moses' law. No. That's not what this text teaches. Watch verse 3. For what the law could not do. Wait, wait, what could not the law do? The law could not free me. Moses' law could not free me from the law of sin and death. That's that those those sinful passions that has caused me to have a state of spiritual death. And that, and them sinful passions, church. You you got to be careful with them because watch this. This is what a lot of folk don't like either. When Jesus lifted the condemnation, he didn't take away your proclivity to sin. He took away the guilt. Oh, you missed it. Come on. When there's no condemnation, that does not mean you will never sin again. Amen. Amen. It means that in Christ, I have the capacity to stay in right relationship with Jesus based on his death and 
not the perfection of my performance. Yeah. 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 Now that's gospel. Yeah. You see, and, and I don't know why folks, when you, I think anybody could testify here that when you got saved, you ain't, you still struggle. Now, we get better in that we don't live in sin. We don't practice a lifestyle of sin, but you still struggle with the occasion of sin. Oh, church. All right, I'll use myself. I'll go against my better judgment. So when I got saved, I talked to Alvin. He's a very forgiving person. So, Alvin, when I got saved, before I got saved, I was, I was in a relationship with a female. Uh -huh. And um, had a good relationship. And when I grew up, I gave my life to Jesus. She said, that is wonderful. <laughs> and then she said, you ready to go upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> this is the part of the story <laughs> where I would love to tell you. <laughs> I would love to tell you that I said because God is in my life I got the Holy Spirit that prevents me from saying yes to your offer man I went up them stairs I'm sorry y'all that's how that story went you want to know why it went like that I was a new creature in Christ but I still had to deal with my sinful passion. Are you following that? I got better as time went. When she made the offer, that time I said no twice. I'm not going to help you. It's all right. And then, but then on that third week, I fell again. Y'all not going, that's all right. I'll be the only one to be real up in here. You don't. You, don't, you can wear your halo. I'm going to tell the truth. And then I went a month. Nothing happened. But in month number two, I fell again. But then three months went by. Four months went by. And after a while, she said, I can't be in this relationship no more. Let me help y'all. When folk get in the church, you got to learn to give them time to grow in grace and in knowledge. Everybody's not like you. That gets it right, right away. Sometimes So when you say Jesus saved you from sin, come here. He saved you from the penalty. He didn't save you yet from the presence. So you deal, you still have to deal with the presence of sin, although he's lifted the penalty. So when I mess up, I can appeal to the blood to put me back in right standing with God. Are you seeing that? How does it work? All right, I promise I'm done. I know I've been a little long. I'm, I'm done. Look at verse 3 and 4. I promise this is done. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh. Watch it. The New American Standard reads beautiful. beautiful. It says, God did. Okay, I'm going to read it again. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Amen. God did what the law could not. Amen. Amen. What did he do? God will lift the condemnation that the law was incapable of freeing you from. Amen. Now you need to ask how. Amen. Come here. Look at verse 3. How'd you do it, God? <laughs> Sending his own son. In the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin. Wait, come here. As an offering for sin, he, Jesus, God, condemned sin. Wait. 
when you see Jesus on the cross, mm -hmm. not only is he dying in your place, but God is rendering judgment. Mm -hmm. Watch that. Mm -hmm. A judgment took place when Jesus was on the cross. Mm -hmm. God condemned what had you condemned. Yeah. God condemned what had you condemned. God judged sin so that he could give you mercy. Come here. God deals with what is in you without condemning you. Uh, God condemns what's in you so he could make you righteous. Y'all see that? Can I borrow somebody for just a minute and I'll close this out? I need one person to come up front and then I promise this is done. Let's show you how this works. In the Garden of Gethsemane, no, excuse me, the Garden of, of Eden, face me, there was a time when God and Adam had perfect fellowship. Adam sinned. God hates sin. What God hates got in what he loves. So God's got to figure out a way to deal with what he hates without killing what he loves. Because what he hates is in what he loves. And because what he hates is in what he loves, what he loves, what he loves, he now has to separate from. And even though he loves me, I am now postured as God's enemy. Because there is now enmity between me and God. Because what he hates is in what he loves. So God's got to find a way to deal with what he hates without destroying. I need one more person. I need one more person. One more person. One more person. All right, now, 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 now. You stand on that second step and face us. All right. Now, God said, I can't let sin go unpunished because I will not be a just God. God cannot let sin go unpunished. He will not be just if he lets sin go unpunished. Don't believe for one minute that when God saved me, he overlooked sin. He did not. In order to save what he loves, he's got to condemn what he hates. And because what he hates is in what he loves, what he loves should die. Because the wages of sin, he's supposed to die because he left in what God hates. And what should happen is when someone sins, the penalty should be death. But the problem is God loves him. And he's got to find a way to save what he loves. So what he will do is he will not overlook sin. He will simply get a substitute. Stand in front of him. Face me. Now, God not only wants a substitute, but he's got to find one that does not have in it what he hates. Because the only way the sacrifice 
Christ works is if the sacrifice does not have in it what he hates. That's what got man in trouble. So what God did is God said, I need an innocent sacrifice. Watch this. And since I can't find nobody, nobody on earth is able to function as an innocent sacrifice. So God sent himself. God. God. And God had a meeting in him. The one God manifested in three personalities. God, God and God had a meeting. God said, I need to send you. God agreed and God went. So when God went, God went and came down to earth and then while God was at the river Jordan, he baptized him, or rather John baptized his son. So you got God in heaven shouting down to God in the water and God the Holy Spirit descending like a dove because God, God and God came up with a scheme of redemption and since God had to save man, he knows that man can only come back to God by God so God sent himself. When he's a sacrifice, it permits that man and God can get back in fellowship. Amen. Because he deals with what he hates without destroying what he loves. Are you seeing that? You two have your seat. Now, if you understand that, here's what happens. Here's what happens. He, when he says Jesus, verse 4 says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Righteousness. That's the commandment of the law. The commandment of the law is every man should be righteous. Problem is we couldn't do it. God sent his son Jesus to die for us so that the righteousness of God could be fulfilled in us who are no longer ruled by the flesh. But walk after the spirit of God. Do you see that? Now what does that mean? Not in the flesh. I don't have time. So drop down to verse 8. And this is what Christians have to learn. If you don't get this in your spirit right here. You got to learn to define yourself the way God defines you. Watch verse 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. What does it mean to be in the flesh? It means to be ruled by my sinful passion. Watch this. Verse 9, however, you, Christians, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Wait a minute. But I still struggle with it. Yeah, but you ain't ruled by it. Don't interpret what you struggle with to mean that it rules you. Are you finally what I'm saying? I tell folk all the time, don't define me by my situation. The movie ain't over yet. Amen. Christians are in the flesh, are not in the flesh. We are in the sphere of where the Holy Spirit rules. I will still have a struggle with sin, but it will not dominate my life. You know why? I got the blood that will break where sin tries to dominate. And the spirit is transforming my lifestyle. Are yeah. y'all following me? If you're here tonight, yes, sir. I want you to be clear that you have God's grace by, by virtue of the fact that he's allowed Jesus to be your righteousness. Don't you let nobody put the shackles of praise on you. That is, shackle you from praising him. Because they not the one who freed you from this problem. God deserves all of the glory and honor. I told the church last week there were some prisoners of war that was in a third world country. The United States made a deal to get them released. The men got on a plane and flew back to the United States. One of them got on the plane started kissing the floor. The people watching did not know where they had come from. But this man knew where he had been. 
And the first thing he did was bow down and start kissing the floor. When they asked him, what are you doing? He said, if you only knew the cave I've been in. Well, mm. And if you only knew what I've been through for the last six months, then you would understand why I have no choice but to bow down and kiss this girl. Yeah. When folk try to shackle your prayers, remind them if you only knew the cave I've been in and the sin I struggled with, you would understand the degree of my praise. All of you stand where you are. Everyone stand where you are. Stand where you are. Do you understand grace tonight? That's why I'm here. I want to make sure you understand grace. I want to make sure you're clear about what Jesus did. I, I, before I leave here, I will show how the church fits in that. But I don't want to preach the church before I preach Jesus. We'll talk about the church. But we're going to talk about it in the proper context. And I'm going to help you understand that the church is the body of the saved. Yes. That's what it is. It's the body of the saved. But when I preach the church, I'm going to admit truth, but I'm going to expose tradition. All right. All right. Brother Elijah told me I could tell the truth here. So I'm going to do that. I, I'm going to admit the truth, but we're going to have to expose tradition. Yes. Because if you're not careful, folk will think we are a cult. Yes. Amen. Yes. And they have thought that. Yes. Because of how we explain yes. what we call the New Testament church. Yes. People, people in the back of the day say, y'all, y'all, y'all are a cult. And, and I back then I used to fight it. But now I'm like, I guess we did act a little bit like a cult. You, you, you don't want to teach the church in a way that gives people the impression you are spiritually arrogant. The church is the body of the saved. And we get in that body by the grace of God. And folk need to understand that. And we all get in the body the same way. And we'll make sure we make that clear. God bless you. If there's somebody that wants to be saved tonight, I want you to come. I want you to give your life to Jesus. I want you to say yes to him. And I want you to do it right now. If you need prayer, if for no other reason, you might be saying, Brother hey, what I just want to thank God that through these lessons I've become free. Because some of you have been under preaching that put you in chains. And I'm trying my best to help you be free. I want you to be northbound. Yes. That's what I want you to be. And don't look back. Uh, now, on Wednesday night, I give you a head start. Wednesday night, to, not tomorrow night, Wednesday night, I'm preaching a sermon called The Tragedy of a Missing Verse. I need you to come back to hear it because I want to talk about the future of this congregation. Right. And one of the things that you, well, you will never be successful if you are controlled by people that don't go here. I need you to come. If you don't make no other night, you want to be here Wednesday. You cannot do great things in the kingdom controlled by a brotherhood. You're going to have to get now. If you don't get that in your spirit, you will always stay where you are. So Wednesday, the tragedy of a missing verse. And I'm going to show you the churches that never move forward are in the missing verse. I'm going to show you that on Wednesday. And I don't want you to get trapped. I care too much about you and I care too much about Elijah. You're two years old now? Is this two years? Two powerful years. I'm positive without knowing your history that it was a rough start. I don't even know your history and Elijah hasn't shared it with me. And I don't want him to because I want to preach to you untainted. But what I want to show you is look at where God has brought you from. And what you don't want to do is start looking back and you shown up don't want to listen to folk that don't even go here. Why 
they doing that over there? Why you care? You don't go here. Go back to your stagnant, non-moving congregation and let northbound be northbound. We ain't bothering nobody. We love everybody. We want to see everybody successful. But as for me and the northbound church, we going to serve the Lord. And you got to get that in your spirit. It's called the theology of I don't care. <laughs> May God bless you tonight. Uh, we'd love to see all of you back tomorrow. May God bless you. Let's sing now the song of invitation. <laughs>